thank you very much for the nice introduction. I don't know if we are really brilliant, but I'm certain that Ruben and I work really hard. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Susan Bernal. I work at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Today I'm going to talk about advances in in neutral salts activation of blast furnace lags. But before starting my presentation, I would like to express my gratitude First of all, to the RILEM organization for giving me this medal, also the members of the jury for selecting me. For me, it's a real honor to be here today. I'm actually really excited because I will have the opportunity to show you some of my new research. But also, I would like to share with you a little bit of my story within RILEM. I joined soon after I finished my PhD. So I was like a little, just a student coming to these meetings, meeting all these important people. And honestly, having the opportunity to interact with senior academics, knowing them in a person and also professional level has really helped to shape my career. So I will encourage other people to be brave and to join this organization because you can gain a lot from the interactions. So before going into the technical part of my presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about myself. So once upon a time, I was a little PhD student in Colombia in South America. So I did a doctorate in engineering material science. I had the opportunity to do an internship at the University of Melbourne in Australia, working with Professor Gianni van der Venta and John Provis. My first postdoc was actually here in Denmark so it's very nice to be here receiving this medal today. Later on, I went back to Australia. Perhaps I really like kangaroos and koalas. And I spent a couple of years there working uh, in an industrial sponsored project to develop alkali activated concretes. So I work with Gianni van der Vente, Peter Duxon, John Provis, and I have been at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom of the past four years. So, one of the things I want to highlight is with all the political things that are going on all over the world, it's that science is global. And this is one of the things I really love about what I do, that it doesn't matter where you come from, what is really important is that science is a language that we all can speak in any language. So, it's really nice. So, now going into the technical stuff. Alkali activated cements, are polyclinker free cements that are produced via chemical reaction between an aluminosilicate or calcium siliconaluminate source that I will call precursor throughout this presentation and an alkaline source that I will call activator. If the material is properly formulated and cured, it can develop desirable mechanical and durability properties. When I start working in this area, the only examples I could find of actual application of alkali activated cements were very old buildings that were built in the former Soviet Union. But today, I want to show you these two really nice examples. One is this building at the University of Queensland in Australia, and this is one very cool example that I found out a few years ago. If you look at this picture, you can see the size of this building. This is in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and this is the Temple of Solomon. But what is really interesting about this is that most of the cladding outside this massive building in the middle of one of the biggest cities in the world is made with alkali activated cements. So it's not, nowadays, it's not just alkali activated cements used to, to patch a little hole in the pavement, or it's not hidden anymore. So, People is using it in major scale applications, and also people can interact with the material. This is really important because we don't have good documentation of the track record, and having this type of applications will really help us and will enable us to understand if these materials can perform really well in the long term. Historically, we have used three main type or precursors to produce alkali activated cement or concretes, mainly fly ashes, blast furnace slag, or calcine clays. But 
because these materials are highly used by the construction industry nowadays, there have been a different drive uh, to try to find different types of precursors. Also, alkali activation is gaining more and more space within the research community as a means for valorizing or managing ways that otherwise will have zero or no commercial value. So here I just want to give a brief overview of some of the precursors that people is studying extensively at the moment. Some of those are urban waste, agro-industrial waste, mining, waste from all sorts of industries. What's really important and is one of the key messages that we need to bear in mind is a lot of these wastes are actually available in places where the need for infrastructure is really high. So I don't want to say that alkali activated cement is the silver bullet that will resolve all the sustainable problems that we have at the moment in the construction industry. What I want to say is that alkali activation technology is a very good opportunity for us to valorize waste from different sources. Now I would like to drive your attention to the alkali activator. So historically, people like to use sodium hydroxide, sodium silicates as activators, and at the very beginning of research of this type of materials, some people use sodium carbonate, sodium sulfate. The activator is also a key component of the alkali activated cement system. It's important its nature, how much activator we add within the system, and also if we add the activator in a solid or liquid state. We all know that one of the main roles of the activator is buffer the pH within the cement, because this will control the solution of the chemical species we need to form binding products within these materials. What has been neglected is the role of the functional group within the activator. So a clear example of this is when we use sodium hydroxide as an activator, we reach much higher pH than when we use sodium silicate. However, there is a good consensus that when we use sodium silicate, we reach more higher mechanical performance, which indicates that the silicates are participating in the chemical reaction. So the activator mainly will control kinetics of reaction, which type of phases we're going to form, the form microstructure of these cements, and finally, the microscopic properties. Well, how my talk is focusing need neutral salt activators. What's wrong with sodium silicate? That's finally everyone is starting to fall in love with sodium silicate to produce alkali activated cement. So the message here is nothing is really wrong. But like everything in life, there is always room for improvement. So one of the first things is we reach really high pH within the pore solutions when we use sodium silicate activators. Nowadays, we really don't understand how corrosion will take place when we have a steel rebars embedded within this type of concrete. So it will be unfair for me to say, because we have a very high pH, it will corrode. It's something we really don't understand, because the chemistry of these cements is much more complex than that. But the second thing that is also calling my attention personally is the fact that roughly 80% of the embodied energy that is typically allocated to an alkali activated cement corresponds to sodium silicate activator, which is quite concerning because one of the drivers to develop this type of materials is that they are tremendously environmentally friendly, they're green cement and so on. So the question is, can we make it greener? But another thing that is really important is our attention is always driven to CO2 emissions. These are some recent results published in the Rylum Technical Letters, where it's highlighted that effectively, if we have different types of precursors, fly ash, slag, metacaline, yes, alkali activated cement can give us some CO2 savings. But what's really concerning is what's going on 
with the human toxicity? What's going on with the ecotoxicity that these materials can generate? It's very important to mention here that so little amount of studies that can be reliable and are accurate to determine a life cycle assessment of this type of materials, then it's an area of research that really requires attention because we cannot claim that material is green. We just focus just in one of the potential environmental impacts the material will have. So thinking about this, uh, three, four years ago, I was motivated to say, okay, what happened if we change sodium silicate for something else? So I put all my efforts in the new neutral salts activation. So I remember back then, a lot of people say, oh, <coughs> lots of people have tried this, it never worked. Why are you starting this again? But anyway, I say, well, I want to give it a shot. And I've been working on this topic over the past four years, so it seems like I have some interesting story to say now. So the first thing is, with new neutral salts, they're cheaper than sodium silicate. Why? Because they can be mined, they can be obtained from other industrial processes, so actually we can have them as byproducts as well. The pH we reach is moderate pH, which is desirable for handling the material. So for instance, when we have sodium carbonate solutions, the pH is roughly 11, which is comparable to a blended pool and cement. Or when we use sodium sulfate activator, the pH is seven, which is just pretty much like water. The other thing is we produce more workable paste when we use this type of activators, which means that we can play a little bit more with the design of our material to achieve very high performance. And finally, they are considered more environmentally friendly than sodium metasilicate. So there is room for developing greener alkali activated materials. But of course, there is a problem because I'm not clever enough to be the first one thinking and using this technology. So one of the main constraints has been the delayed strength development. So we can see here in this isothermal calorimetry that after mixing, the onset of the acceleration period when we can identify the beginning of the formation precipitation of a hydration products takes place after a week, which is not desirable at all for concreting. Or this might limit the application of this material just for precasting. So some people have tried to overcome this issue using high temperature curing or adding some different things to the systems, but I wanted to follow a different approach. So we did a very detailed analysis of these materials from day one up to 180 days, and we identified that effectively at very early times of curing, the material is very heterogeneous, is porous, which is consistent with the low mechanical performance. However, at later stages of reaction, we can see the material is very homogeneous, very dense, consistent, with the increase in the tortuosity, increase in mechanical performance. So the question was, what's driving this? Will be this the case for any slack in the world? And the answer is no. So I remember actually in Paris in one of the meetings of the Ryland Technical Committee, I was discussing with Jose from Laval University in Canada. And about some of my results, and she said, oh, the Canadian slacks have very high content of magnesium. And I said, could you please send me five kilograms of your slack? And she was very kind to do it. So that really helped us to unveil some of the chemistry of these systems. So here I'm showing some uh, isothermal calorimetry results again, where we can see that if we use slacks with different chemical compositions, First, we see that the precipitation of reaction products is taking place at different times. And also we can see here how when the magnesium, when magnesium content within the slag increases, we can also achieve higher degrees of reaction. To understand the mechanism driving this type of behavior, we went back to analyze what's going on 
in the alkali activated slags when we use metasilicate. So by a thermodynamic modeling, we know we can predict that as the magnesium content within the slag increases, we favor formation of these phases, magnesium aluminum layer double hydroxides or hydrotalkites. And we identify that in the slags with high content of magnesium, the natural or accelerated carbonation of these materials is significantly reduced. So we know that there is an interaction between the hydrotalkite and the CO2 present in the system. So if we consider that when we use sodium carbonate activator, the activator is actually providing carbonates to the system, it's more likely that those carbonates are chemically bind by these phases. But of course, we needed to prove that our hypothesis was correct. So what we did is we got some commercially available hydrotalkite, which we call sign to remove any potential carbonate within its structure. And then what we did was adding to different sodium carbonate activated systems 10%, 10 weight percent of this, we call it a smart admixture. So we can see how in this isothermal calorimetry, how including this layer double hydroxide significantly modifies the kinetics of reaction. This effect is more notorious when we have slags with low magnesium content, and of course, the effect is less notable when we have high magnesium contents within the slag. What is really interesting here is that if we match the right activator to the right slag, we can produce a material with the desirable properties we want to achieve. So after a lot of hard work, a lot of discussions, a lot of thinking, we came up with this schematic uh, mechanism of reaction when we use sodium carbonate activator. So in this case, we can see when we have this material, we favor formation of the different poly polymorph of calcium carbonate. And if we have very low contents of magnesium, we will form hemicarbonate or monocarbaluminate, a later age of reaction. If we have high contents of magnesium within the system, we will favor formation of layer double hydroxides. But when we include this smart addition of the calcine layer double hydroxide, we see these three effects. One is we will have an increase in the alkalinity of the system because the layer double hydroxide will recrystallize. So it will absorb some of the water within the system. Also, it will accelerate the consumption of carbonates. And finally, we can see that some of the particles of this layer double hydroxide actually you are working as nucleation points. So everything sounds really nice, to be honest, from a chemical perspective. But then we say, will this be durable? So many of you that work with me know that I get carried away. <laughs> and I just want to answer every single question. So we did some preliminary studies uh, immersed in these samples for nearly one year in chloride solutions. And these are just some of the results we, we collected, where we can see that the formation of AFM phases, even without the smart addition, is very beneficial because we can identify chloride binding. But also when we have these calcinolated double hydroxide, we can see now we form different sites of the AFM phases uh, that can chemically bind chlorides. So I'm not, showing, not going to show the results today, but we also did some natural and accelerated carbonation tests within these systems, and we can see also that the carbonation resistance is significantly improved compared with sodium silicate. So we, are, we believe that we have been working with a material that can be potentially greener than what had been done before, and potentially more durable. So we are also doing some corrosion testing and so on. So hopefully in the future I can tell you that I was correct or I was completely incorrect, we will see. So I'm going just to discuss briefly about sodium sulfate activated slag cements. So again, this is not new. Many people have worked with sodium sulfate activator. 
developing the so-called hybrid cements or supersulfate cements. But one of the things that I wanted to see is if the functional group of this activator was going to have a similar effect than the sodium carbonate. So in this case, we can also see significant differences in the isothermal calorimetry when we use slags with different contents of magnesium. But what's really interesting here is that the main differences in precipitation of reaction products actually are identified at very early times of reaction. But once the material has like stabilized, we can reach comparable degrees of reaction independently of the chemistry of the slag we're using. So we did some thermodynamic modeling of these systems to identify what's going on when we have different chemical compositions and also why we see this precipitation of reaction products at different times of, of reaction. And we can identify, for instance, when we vary the magnesium content within the slag, there is no significant changes in the amount of cash phases we form in the system. But what's really interesting is how our very er 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 low contents of magnesium, we favor formation of hydrotalkites. Well, in this case, because the database for late double hydroxides doesn't contain double hydroxides that are enriching sulfur, we couldn't model that. But in theory, we are expecting that we will form layer double hydroxides rich in sulfur, and perhaps with different chemical composi compositions to the ones that the model is predicting. In this case, when we have bearing aluminum oxide content, we can see formation initially of gypsum, and also we can see formation of ettringite, and is these layer double hydroxides. This uh, well, the model is not absolutely perfect, but it makes absolute sense with some of the XRD results we are collecting, so we think it's a very promising uh, way to go. So to finalize my presentation, I would like to say that, well, after nearly 11 years working in the area of alkali activation technology, we have done significant advances in understanding the chemistry of these cements. So here, I just include a very brief of a view of what I think or believe that is going on in the system. But most importantly, now we can somehow have some hints about what could be the most effective activator for a given slack chemistry and intended application. So this is really important uh, to drive a standardization of formulation of this type of materials. So, well, it's really important to acknowledge all the people that has allowed me to be here today. So I would like to thank firstly to John Provis, my husband, because he has supported me for many years during my career. Also, Ruby Mejia de Gutierrez, she was my PhD supervisor. She also opened many doors for me. Danny Van de Venter, who has been a very good friend and mentor. And of course, my, <laughs> I will say, some of my closest uh, PhD students who have worked really hard and always have followed any crazy idea I have had. So first, Irawati Ismail in Sarawak University in Malaysia, Shinoan Ki from University of Sheffield, and Rupert Myers, who has always helped us with thermodynamic modeling. I would like to thank the Cements at Sheffield team because they're very patient. And of course, all my, my collaborators and friends all over the world and my family. Also, it's very important to acknowledge to all the different institutions, organizations, so on, that have sponsored my research over the past years. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for this very interesting lecture. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes, Neil? Maybe I can start. Uh, Susan, you said, okay, you can use this uh, new butter activator or more sustainable activating system, but uh, if the slag has enough uh, magnesium in it, 
Well, uh, one of the things that, one of the main outcomes of our research is that we can manipulate actually the kinetic of the reaction of slags that have very low content of magnesium if we add these calcinolate double hydroxides. So using sodium carbonate activators or sodium sulfate activators is feasible using either, it doesn't matter the, the chemistry of your slag. We have identified that it's like a borderline when the content of magnesium is 5% weight percentage of the total composition, where we don't favor formation of this hydrotile kind. So, so far it seems the hydrotile kind is the key for many of the performance of these cements. I am not aware if there are uh, slags with high contents of magnesium anywhere else in the world, but from, from my experience, the highest ones I've seen have been in Canada. Well, my, my research so far has been up to the mortar level. We will start producing some concretes with these new type of activators and also the, what we call the SMAR admixtures. But that's a little bit limiting because we have been using commercially produced hydrotile kites that we thermally treat and so on, which will not be efficient for commer commercial purposes. So we need to find perhaps another way to produce similar type of admixtures that would enable to have more cost-effective materials. But if you ask me if they can be self-compacting, in general, these materials are very workable. The problem will be controlling the kinetics of reaction. So that is really, it has a very, work, very good workability for a given time and then harden. I think that will be a little bit difficult with these systems. It will be difficult to achieve. Well, some people have, have tried to produce a blend of slag with fly ash activated with sodium carbonate uh, without using any sort of uh, smart addition. My feeling is that the alkalinity you reach is not sufficient to promote the dissolution of aluminosilicate materials. So I don't think it might work. But of course, uh, not many people have worked in this type of systems. Actually, it's very scarce literature available. So perhaps in some years to come, people will be more encouraged to try these new activators and we can find some interesting results. But so far, from what I know, it will, might not work. Thank you very much once again, Suzanne.